Well, if you're new here to Lakeland, I hope that you've maybe figured out that we like to interact a little bit, that this is not just us up here. This is us together coming before the throne of God. And I really want us, I want our hearts, your hearts, our hearts to engage together in this. And so there's interaction. Sometimes we don't even know quite what it looks like to interact. Maybe you're like, man, when the pastor preaches, what does that mean as far as interaction? I grew up in a church where there was this one guy, uh, he was the amener. He, he was the one guy who said, amen, like in a low voice. And there was only one. I thought, man, it's like, how do you get that role? And like when he dies, does he like pass that off to someone else? Like you are now the amener, you know, and it goes to that person. And so let me just teach you kind of the modern day amen. Uh, I, I, I look at it like this. I love it. It's the come on. And if, if you add a little bit of Southern accent in it, it's even better. So you just come on. So let's practice that. One, two, three. Come on, come on now. Come on, one more time. One, two, three. Come on. So, so you say that like when I, you're, you're saying, I'm coming along with you. I want to come on this journey with you. Come on, let's go further with this. So when you hear something, you're like, I agree with that. That's the way that you can interact with me and, and just kind of encourage me even. Sometimes I need it. Sometimes if I'm up here dying, you can just be like, come on. And it like works in that way as well, okay? So multiple levels in which this is good. So today we launch into a new series called Battlegrounds. I'm super pumped about it. Uh, this next three weeks where we're going to be talking about a battle. It's a battle that all of us face. All of us have, uh, are, are get caught in it at some point, usually on a weekly battle or on a weekly basis. And it's the battle right here be between the ears. It's the battle of the mind and learning to win this thing. Have you ever uh, used the phrase or heard the phrase, man, that person's such a head case? You ever heard that? Such a head case. They're, they're, they're saying there's a, there's, they're lost right now in this battle that's happening in their mind. And I remember uh, even when I was a pole vaulter in high school, because sometimes you see head cases in sports. And there was this one guy who was a vaulter, and he was a head case. Like, before he would start to vault, when they call your name, you have 90 seconds to vault, or you get a, a miss, you know, a fault. And so he would get there at the, at the end of the runway. You start running down the runway with this pole, uh, and then if you're... If your feet leave the ground or you touch the mats, it counts as a vault. And so he would run, you know, as fast as he could, about 20 feet right before he got, he'd start coming to a screeching halt, and he would slide down his pole and use it to, like, stop him. And he would, like, precariously balance around the mats, which are all the way out of here, and he'd be like... <gasps> uh, he'd work his way, and they'd run back down, because he's only got 90 seconds. He would do that three or four times <laughs> before he ran out of time, and the guy would literally be watching his watch, and he'd go, fault. Every time he ran out of time. And we would often say about this guy, we said, you missed your vault before you even stepped on the runway because you lost it up here. You had already lost the vaults in your head. You had already psyched yourself out. You were a head case. And it doesn't take much to get us lost wrestling in our heads. And the enemy, I'll refer to the enemy a lot. This is the devil. It's really demonic forces that serve the devil that speak and whisper to us lies. And the enemy is really good at strategizing uh, to get in this battle that we engage with him in, in your mind. But here's the thing that you all need to know, because this is really important. Are you aware that the enemy has already lost the battle? Come on. That is, the enemy has already lost the battle. But here's the thing. Christians don't understand how to engage in the battle and enforce the victory that Jesus won for you. And so as a result, the enemy keeps us tied up, keeps us feeling like, man, we're, we're losing this thing. This is a real tough battle when actually it's actually not a really tough battle. It's learning the strategies and the methodologies to win this thing that you will actually become very successful at winning this battle and not feel like, man, I'm caught in it time and time and for like long time periods. You don't have to be. We know how easy it is to become a head case. And what I want to do is over the next three weeks, Weeks, give us some real practical steps for us to be able to start winning the battle in your mind. Scripture talks about our mind quite a bit. Uh, here's some of the things that Scripture says our minds can be confused. They can be anxious, closed, evil, restless, rash, deluded. Don't try to write all those down. Uh, if you Actually, I want to just highlight, if you go to our small group discussion questions, all of our slides are always uploaded up there. So you can go and go back and check out all these Scripture references, okay? Uh, the Bible talks about a troubled mind, a depraved mind, a sinful mind, a dull mind, a blinded mind, a corrupt mind. The mind is actually talked about a ton in the Word of 
God. And then how in the world we engage in doing something about this thing, about our minds. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says this, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Come on, by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So let's just kind of talk that thing through. He says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Question, does everyone that you know some time or at some point in their life face the, the mental battle? Yeah. Are there strategies that the world comes up with, patterns that the world comes up with to try to deal with the war? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's like motivating or motivational speakers. That's what a lot of times motivational speakers are doing. They're giving you kind of worldly practices to try to win the mental battle. Positive thinking, leadership practices. Sometimes it's even repressing thoughts, skirting issues, repress, you know, like passive aggression. There can be bad methodologies, bad patterns. He says, don't conform to the patterns of this world. Instead, you can actually become transformed but you'll become transformed when you learn how to renew your mind, literally to make new your mind. You can have a new thought process. Instead of the patterns that you've used in the past, you can have a new thought process for how to go to war in your mind. So are you guys ready to go to, go to war in the mind? How do we go to war in our minds and actually come out successful on the other side? So I want to use actually uh, a, a verse out of Joshua. It's Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, as the template for our next three weeks together uh, to see what God said to Joshua in terms of how he would, what he needed to do to win the battle, to be successful and prosperous in the battle. Okay, now Joshua, you got to understand the context of this. Joshua is actually getting ready to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. They've been wandering in the desert for the last 40 years. God has said, I've got this special land. I've promised it to you, hence the promised land, that you guys are going to go and take. But the, there's a problem. There are massive communities and cities, and literally there are massive people, giants, communities of NBA-sized people that live in the promised land. There's massive fortified cities like Jericho, the very first city they're going to face. And so do you think this could have them a little bit like worried? Yeah, so God preps Joshua and says, here's the things you've got to keep in mind to win this battle. And he says this, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Now, while Joshua is about to face a literal physical battle, I believe that the template of what God shares with him also is the template for winning the mental battle in our minds. And actually, we'll see that supported uh, throughout Scripture, throughout this whole series that, that we go through. Uh, but how many of you want to win this mental battle? Okay, 10, 20. Oh, oh now all, more. How many of you want to win this mental battle? How many of you, as you go through the battle, just want to squeak through the battle? How many of you want to be prosperous and successful in the battle? See, that's the last part of the verse. He says, I'm not going to just get you through this thing. We're going to be prosperous and successful in this journey and in this battle. And so that's how we want to head into it. So there's, I want to look at three phrases in this verse over the next three weeks to help us learn how to be prosperous and successful in this mental battle that we're fighting. And it, we're going to start with the phrase, meditate on it day and night. It's right there in the middle of the verse. Meditate on it day and night. Now, what is it? The book of the law. Now, at this time, they didn't have the entire Bible. They had the book of the law, which was the law that God gave to Moses. And so it's like the Torah, basically. It's the beginning of, the, of what we know as our Bible today. That's what they had. And so he says, I want you to meditate on it, the book of the law, the word of God, day and night. Meditation is where we start to win the battle in our minds. If you want to be victorious in this battle, Meditation of the Word of God and understanding how it works is critical. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at. But before we go any further, as soon as I said the word meditation, for some of you, you actually had kind of a red flag that went up. You know, kind of a check in your, in your heart because you're like, meditation, ew, I don't like that word. Because 
over recent years, you think about meditation and you go, well, meditation, that's like a new agey thing. That's like a home thing. Like, I don't, I don't want to do any of that. But that's not what biblical meditation is. See, the devil is actually really, he's strategic. And he, scripture tells us that he's a liar. He's a thief. He's a robber. He's, he likes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's not a creator. He was a created being. So he doesn't create things. He actually steals things that exist, and he warps them, and he twists them. And so he takes something that's actually a God-given thing, meditation, and he flips it on his head. So in modern day kind of new agey meditation, the process looks like this. To meditate means to empty your mind. We empty our mind and we let anything hit us. The reason why you never want to empty your mind is because you don't know what's going to come on in and fill your mind. Instead, biblical meditation doesn't mean to empty your mind. It actually means to fill your mind. You're very purposeful that we actually fill up our mind with what? The Word of God. Meditate on it, the Word of God, day and night. You saturate your mind with the word of God. So here's the deal. If you've thought, man, I, I want to steer clear of this. You've got to get over this. You've got to steal back the word and say it was never the devil's to rob. It is God's word and meditation biblically is ours and we're going to do it. It's a good thing. Uh, so, so what I want to do is I want to give us two simple first steps to winning the battle of the mind with the word of God in this realm of meditation. I call it first steps because in the subsequent weeks, we're going to look at additional steps to win this battle of the mind. But the first of the steps is to capture the thought. Everyone say, capture the thought. Capture the thought. Capture the thought. All right. Capture the thought. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Hey, can I get a Jedi to check our air? I am hot. Now, it could just be me, but I, I'm warm. Thanks. I, all right. <laughs> I know sometimes we pray, God, pour out your fire upon us. In this case, I want some air conditioning upon me. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, okay? This is what it says. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight are not the weapons of this world. On contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension. That's not a word we use too often, but it can also be literally translated barrier that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Okay, so let's talk this thing through. Very similar to how Paul wrote both the book of Romans and he wrote this book to the church in Corinth, okay? And so here he says, we do not conform to the patterns of the world. Or in Romans, he says, we do not conform to the patterns of the world. Here he says, we do not wage war the same way that the world wages war. I think it's interesting that here he uses the illustration of a battle, of a war that's taking place to describe what's taking place in the ears and between the ears in the mind right this is this is the picture he uses is a battle to describe the war that's happening in the mind he says we don't use the same weapons and we don't use the same tactics that the world uses just like in Romans we don't use the same patterns of the world instead we're transformed as we learn how to renew our mind verse 5 he says this we demolish arguments the, uh, the Greek word that gets translated demolish literally could be translated, we tear down. We're going to grab these things and we're going to tear them down. What are we tearing down? We're tearing down arguments. The, the Greek word that gets translated arguments is logesmos. Everyone say logesmos. Logesmos. I know you're going to forget it before you leave. I'll forget it before I leave. But logesmos, it can be translated arguments, but it also can be translated imaginations or reckonings. You need to learn how to tear down the imaginations or your reckonings that come up against the knowledge of God. Now, here's why I think this is so important. is because imaginations and how our imagination works is often the place where we lo lose the battle. Fear feeds in the place where we imagine the worst. Right? Fear feeds in the places where we imagine the worst. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, a couple years ago, my son Braden, he's sitting right down here, uh, he, we were over here working one day, and he actually got his hand crushed, and we thought he might have broken some bones in his fingers. So we ran on over to the ER, and we got an x-ray. And as they x-rayed his hand, they said, oh, this is good, there are no broken bones. But the doctor looked at it, and he circled a spot on Braden's fourth finger, and he said, 
that is an unusual spot. I don't know what that is. I feel like I, we need to send this over to a specialist. It's a dark spot on an x-ray, and I don't know what that is. So he sent it to a specialist, and that specialist looked at it, and he said, I don't know what that is. I feel like uh, I'm going to send it to another specialist. So that specialist sent it to a specialist, and that specialist looked at it, and he said, I don't know what that is. So he sent it to another specialist. I started thinking, these specialists aren't very special. <laughs> or they need to get a different specialty. So finally, another guy called me. He said, hey, I'm a specialist. And I said, no kidding. And uh, he said, I am the pediatric oncologist doctor, downtown Milwaukee. I know, and that's exactly what we did. Oncologist, the, the bone cancer doctor is calling. And he says, I'm looking at this x-ray, and we need to set up an appointment. Well, my schedule's really busy, and the earliest I can get you guys in is in two weeks. Okay, so what do you have? We have an x-ray of a dot. We've been referred to many specialists, and the final specialist is the bone cancer specialist who says, I need an appointment with you. So now you got two weeks for your imagination to run wild. And, and for the next couple weeks, that's what Lisa and I found ourselves wrestling with, the battle in the mind. Reckoning, the reckonings and the imagination. What if it's bone cancer? What if it's stage one? What if it's stage two, stage three, stage four? What would this mean for our family? What if he needs uh, to go through chemo? What if he passed away? What would the family dynamics uh, be? What about the financial impact upon our family with this? What if, what if, what if, what if, right? All these what ifs, all, what did we do? What is, what's so, it's so easy to do. It's the imaginations, which is why he says, you need to learn how to demolish the imaginations, the reckonings, the arguments that are being formed in your mind that come up against our God. And, and, and so he says, we got to figure out how to do this. How many of you have ever lost sleep uh, over fear or anxiety? You ever lost sleep over fear or anxiety? Awesome. It means you know how to meditate, right? Now we just need to change the subject matter, <laughs> right? You know how to meditate. You, you know how to fill your mind. You're just filling your mind with fear and anxiety. You're rehearsing, rehearsing and reckoning fear and anxiety as opposed to changing the subject, according and uh, allowing the word of God to be that subject. So we need to learn to demolish the imaginations that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. How do we do that? That first step, we take a thought captive. We capture the thought. So verse five says, take every thought captive. So here's what I sometimes do. I literally personify my fears or my uh, anxieties, the situation I'm facing, the lie I'm believing, and I picture it like a person. Maybe a faceless person, but I personify it. So, and then I, I kind of put a T-shirt on it with whatever the fear is that I'm facing. Uh, it, it might be like you're you're inadequate. You're no one's going to show up to a Saturday night service. You're going to fail at this. You know you're you're not good enough. You shouldn't receive forgiveness. I I'm able to identify that fear and kind of write it on the T-shirt. I literally capture. It. I put it in jail. That's what I do. I, I imagine putting it in jail. Now, here's one of the tactics of the enemy, is the enemy actually can keep us bound up when we're unable to identify what the lie is, when we don't know what it is actually that we need to catch. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you've always been kind of a, a person who just keeps to yourself and uh, maybe a guarded individual. You struggle to let people in. Maybe you've struggled to let God in. And you've always used the phrase uh, like this. I'm just a guy who I just like to keep to myself. Or I'm a gal, I just like to keep to myself. Now, does that sound bad? No, it doesn't sound bad at all. It sounds like, okay, you're just maybe kind of an introverted person. You like to keep to yourself. That's fine. But here's the deal. Is if, you're, if you're not willing to kind of go down the path and say, why is it I act and live the way I act and live? And kind of venture down that journey. What if it is that you guard yourself because maybe you were abandoned by your parents? Maybe your dad abandoned you. Maybe all of your family members abandoned you. Maybe your friends have all abandoned you. Maybe you have abandonment issues. And, and literally, it, for you, the outcome has been, I don't feel like I can let anyone in. I'm a guarded individual. But for you, you've just kind of said, ah, I just like to keep to myself. But there's actually lies connected with your lifestyle and your personality and the way you're living. Some of those lies might be things like people can't be trusted. That is a lie. 
You, while people will let you down, I understand that happens, you actually cannot become the person that God wants you to become uh, independent of other believers. You're never meant to live in isolation. You're meant to live in community with other believers lifting you forward. Hence why he says, as iron sharpens iron, so one believer sharpens another believer. I Meaning you can't become as sharp as you're supposed to be alone. And so if you say, I'm just a guarded individual, you're never going to become the person God made you to be alone. You just can't. Another lie that you might believe is no one uh, will ever be reliable in relationships for me. Or there's something wrong with me that has always led to abandonment. Or if I trust God and I start reaching out to him, he's going to see me for who I am and he'll probably abandon me too. See, these are all types of lies that actually might be deep underneath that root of kind of the umbrella of I just like to keep to myself. And if you can't identify and name the lie, write the t-shirt, write the word across the t-shirt on that person, you don't know what to capture. You're just going through life going, I feel out of sorts, but I don't know why. You have to be able to capture the thought, capture the lie, capture the situation that's actually coming against the knowledge of God. So you've got to be able to name it. Then, after you capture the thought, then, uh, I told you, two simple first steps. Then you've got to correct the thought. So first we capture the thought, then we correct the thought. Say correct the thought. Good, I needed that to get a breath. Correct the thought. The rest of verse 5 then says this. Then we make it obedient to Jesus Christ. We make it obedient to Christ. To make it obedient to Christ is to, this is how I picture it. I capture it, then I'm going to hold it up to Christ, and I'm going to say, Christ, what do you think about this thing? And I'm going to hold it there until I figure out how he thinks about it, and then I want to make my mind think about it the same way he thinks about it. Does that make sense? I'm going to hold it because Scripture says that we can actually know and have the mind of Christ. So Christ has an opinion about that lie that you've been believing. So you've got to figure out what's his opinion, what does the Word of God say about that lie, and then hold it up to him and say, what do you think about it? And I'm not going to leave until I think about it the same way you think about it. See, I cannot afford to have a thought in my head about my life or my situation that he does not have in his head about my life or my situation. Come on. Let me say it again, because that's good. I cannot afford to have a thought in my mind about my life or my situation that he does not have in his mind about my life or my situation. So what do I do? I personify the thing that I'm facing. I capture it. I correct it. But here's how I correct it. I correct it by telling it the rules. I tell it the rules according to the kingdom of God. See, to make something obedient, you have to know the rules. Like if my kids are doing something wrong, but, and sometimes I'll yell out like, hey, stop doing that. And they're like, I didn't know we shouldn't do that. They didn't know the rules, so they didn't know that they were being disobedient. So you have to, to correct something, you actually have to know the rules. A few weeks ago, I was playing Sorry with my kids. And there was like this new version of Sorry that I think they made up a lot of these rules. I'm not going to lie. So I'm playing it with them, and they're like, Dad, no, the new rules are this. Like, you get out on all even numbers. I'm like, that's not true. You get out on one and two. That's it. You know, not all even numbers. And then they're like, uh, yeah, and then you can like swap with, on 11s and another number. And then you can like do sorry from anywhere on the board and you just nail anyone. I'm like, these are not the rules. Who told you these rules? And they point to the older sibling. She did. I was like, she probably made them up along the way so that she could beat you. And you guys are all following them. You know, and so here's the deal is that the enemy does the exact same thing. The enemy actually makes up rules and the enemy actually has to follow. Are you aware? He has to follow spiritual rules, the, the rules according to the kingdom of God. So what would be the enemy's tactic to keep you bound up living a, in a lie and not knowing how to correct the lie? Well, I know. Keep the believers from knowing the rules. And then what he will do is he'll sell you a different set of rules, and if you don't correct him, he wins. If you don't correct the lie with the word of God, he actually wins. Let me give you an example. Uh, you need to literally be able to tell the rules to your fears. Tell fear what the rules are. So here's how the enemy might lie around something like fear. He might say something like this. God wants you to grow. And to grow, you've got to endure through fear. Now, this is often a tactic of the enemy. It's been a tactic of, enemy, of the enemy since Genesis chapter 1 and 2, 3, when he lied to Adam and Eve in the garden. I, I have referred to it in the past. It's two truths and a lie. 
The enemy often lies with two truths and a lie. He speaks two truths to get you in, and then he throws in a lie at the end. And the lie is always the, uh, the thing that attacks the character of God or the foundation of the word of God, okay? So he did this with Eve. He, he actually quoted God. Did not God say? Quotes God twice, tells two truths about God. Then his final lie is the attack on the character of God to Eve. God wants to keep you from being like him. That's the attack. But he, he, with Eve, he did two truths and a lie. With us, he does the same thing. So in regards to fear, let me say the statement again. God wants you to grow. He'll often grow you through endurance and as you endure through fear. Did you catch the two truths and a lie? God wants you to grow. That's true. God wants you to grow often through perseverance and endurance. That's true. I, biblically, I can back that easily. Through fear. That's the lie. See, that has this idea that I just need to live in fear for a long period of time. And if I live in fear, ah, dealing with it for a long time, I'll grow. And that's a lie. And you have to be able to say, that's not the rules. I know the rules. The rules are 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. He has not given me a spirit of fear or timidity, but a power of love and a sound mind. That's the rules. So you've got to be able to tell the, the, the enemy the, the lie. That's true, that's true, that's a lie. And I call out the lie, and I correct it, and I tell the enemy the rules. The rules are, he has not given me a spirit of fear. I've read the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Fear's not in the list. So I don't have to learn how to endure through fear. I need to learn that he has not given me a spirit of fear because he's not afraid of anything, and thus he's made me not to be afraid of anything. Those are the rules according to the kingdom of God, and you've got to be able to quote it back. Now, you can't tell him the rules if you don't know the rules. So how in the world do you get that word so deep in your heart, so on the day that you're afraid, it just kind of pours out of you. Now, he hasn't given me a spirit of fear or timidity, but power, love, sound mind. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, what, what? <laughs> but it's got to be so deep in your heart that, that is, that's what comes out of you, so you're able to capture the thought and correct the thought. So you've got to tell your finances the rules. You've got to tell your insecurities the rules. You've got to tell your shame the rules. You've got to tell your anger the rules. You've got to tell your offenses and your lack of forgiveness the rules. You've got to tell your lies that you've been believing the rules. So how do you make something obedient to Christ? Well, you're going to have to know what the rules are for your finances, your insecurities, your shame, your anger, your offenses, and then you'll be able to tell it what the rules are that they have to follow. So you have to meditate on the word so that you're able to actually tell the enemy what the rules are, what the rules of the kingdom of God are. Go all the way back to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This phrase that we're looking at today, meditate on the word day and night. The Hebrew word there for meditate is the word uh, haiga. And it literally gets translated meditate, but it also could be muse. And isn't this interesting? It can also be Imagine, imagine. This is fascinating to me because in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, I want you to demolish, tear down the imaginations that come against the knowledge of God, the truth of God. But God actually wants us to imagine the word of God playing out in our lives day and night. Meaning, <laughs> imagination is not the bad thing. The question is, who's lording over your imagination? Is the enemy lording over your imagination? Are you worrying and thinking of the worst and how the enemy might play out? Or are you allowing the word of God and imagining the word of God to actually play out in your situation? So let me, let me just pull us back to my son with his finger. Let's imagine that if you got that phone call, you got two weeks to imagine how many of you are going to imagine the worst for two weeks? A lot of us. How many of you are going to imagine God providing and there being absolutely nothing there? Because that's actually what happened. It was, it was a, like a, an anomaly of cartilage in his bone. It's nothing. That's what was there, Nothing. How, how many of you are going to imagine, because the word of God says he will provide peace that surpasses understanding. How many of you are going to imagine that you're going to be the most peaceful person that makes no sense, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense to anyone else in this world. It surpasses understanding. How many of you are going to imagine that? Because that's kingdom reality for those of us who are believers. 
How many of you are going to imagine that? How many of you are going to imagine his word playing out and being effective in your life day and night? I picture it like a good marinade. Like, like if you like to grill, you take a, a hunk of meat and you marinate it. And the longer, why do you marinate it? Because you want the meat to take on the flavor of the marinade, right? And the longer you marinate it, the more it takes on the flavor of the marinade. Well, what some of us do is we jump in on Sunday morning and we jump right out and we like, and the marinade just doesn't stick. This is why he says, I want you to meditate on it day and what? It doesn't work for you to just hop in and hop out. You need to let the word of God actually marinate our minds so that our minds actually take the flavor of the word of God, right? So our minds actually take the flavor of heaven so that as we approach any situation, we're able to capture thoughts and correct thoughts, but we know it because we marinated in meditation. And so let me just give you, here's how you meditate. Practical steps for meditation. If you're like, how do I do this? Here's what I would encourage you to do. Pick a subject, pick a word study, okay? Go, if, if you're struggling with anger, fear, anxiety, insecurity, self, you know, identity in Christ, uh, leadership, wisdom, decision-making, just Google it. Verses on those things. Guess what you're gonna get? A whole slew of verses. Then pick one. Not 10, one, one, one. How many? One. one. Print it out or write it out. Make it a screensaver on your phone or on your, on your desktop at work or something like that. Carry it with you wherever you go. Then you meditate on that verse. You imagine that verse being effective in your life, working out in your attitudes and your actions. And you, it will, you will memorize it. You will. It just will happen. If you turn that thing over, you marinate on it and, and in it all day long. So even on the back of your bulletins today, I put a couple verses that I was meditating on over the last couple weeks. So Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, I would encourage you, meditate on those three verses this week. Just those three. Do verse 1 for two days. Do verse 2 for two days. Do verse 3 for two days. And then we'll see you next Sunday. Okay? And I promise you, this little chunk of scripture is going to transform the way you even approach the word of God and think. It will transform you. Amen? Come on. All right, so let's stand and we'll close here in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that uh, you have equipped us to not lose a battle with the enemy in our minds, but actually you have set us up to win it. You've already defeated the enemy. We just simply need to learn how to enforce your victory that you've won for us in our minds using the word of God, which is true and powerful. It corrects us. It divides our thoughts. It brings truth to the surface. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to capture the thoughts, the, the, the lies that we've been believing, and that we would correct them, that we would that we would declare the rules of the kingdom of God over these lies and that they would lose their full power and that literally the enemy would have to run. That the battle that we would be having, we would find it to be actually short and easy because we are meditating on your word day and night and it is changing the way we think. It is marinating our mind to think like heaven, to think like your word. And so we pray all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Be blessed. Thank you so much for being here. We got prayer partners back here. We would love to pray with you if you have any prayer needs. Otherwise, have a great Sunday.